Hi, everyone, and welcome to the program. Speaking of sports, I'm Dale Irving. We're very pleased to welcome a special guest to the studio today, Ray Christensen of WCCO Radio. Now, of course, uh, Ray's name and voice have become synonymous with go for football and go for basketball over the years with KUOM, WLOL, and the last 30 years with WCCO Radio. His straight-ahead sports broadcasting style has pretty much made him a Minnesota institution along with a Minnesota tradition. Uh, Ray Christensen is our guest. Ray, uh, thanks for coming on. It's nice to see you. Oh, my pleasure, Dale. Of course, uh, most people realize that uh, you've released a book now along with Stu Thornley uh, through Noden Press in Minneapolis, and the book is entitled Golden Memories, which chronicles your life uh, pretty much as a child and uh, all the way up through your broadcasting years into the present. Uh, very enjoyable. Uh, we knew you were a versatile broadcaster before, but now you get to uh, add author to your list of credits. Well, a good deal of the credit has to go to Stu Thornley, who helped refine whatever thoughts I had. <laughs> Stu's the historian. I remember things, but not necessarily the right dates. Uh, I remember the people, but not necessarily the overall team they played with. And Stu is so good at that. A uh, compliment to Stu would be that so many people said they could hear my voice in, <laughs> when they read the words. And sure. Uh, well, some of the words are Stu's, which means he adapted to my style very well, which he did. Yeah, it was an excellent job. How did the idea of the book come up, and how did you meet up with Stu? Uh, back in January of 1993, uh, Stu and publisher Norton Stillman asked if I would have dinner with them with the idea of an autobiography in mind. And so uh, I did, and we agreed uh, January 18th. I remember the date because it's the day before my daughter's birthday. <laughs> and uh, we agreed right then to go ahead and see if it would work with an autobiography. And we plowed ahead, uh, went right to it. Stu is one of those people who uh, he really gets at it in a very good way. And so yeah. uh, in about three months, we had the basic book done. Now, basic means there's an awful lot of little stuff left to be done. But sure. it took about three months for the basics. Well, the book is doing very well. Uh, you've been out doing a number of book signings, and as we mentioned earlier, uh, you're semi-retired now with the CCO, and it kind of gives you uh, some more free time to do those types of things. That's right, yeah, although uh, I was still full-time at the time of the book signings, because those go up to Christmas, and then that, that's <laughs> it, because that's when most of the book sales, but they're still selling, oh, like 25 to 50 a week. Uh -huh. when do, let's get in now to your background as you started off as a broadcaster. Um, growing up as a kid, you're from Minneapolis. Yes, right. When, when did you know that radio was going to be your career, that you wanted to do it? I think pretty early. I would guess uh, when I was eight, nine, ten years old, right in there, I had a strong urge to be able to do play-by-play, -play, and I was already doing it in my bedroom or uh -huh. wherever I could be by myself. And then uh, later on uh, with others, like with uh, Don Riley, who fine sports writer for many years, Don and I were good friends and are, and uh, then uh, Dick Kerr, who went on to become a dentist. The three of us, using two dice and a little Calumet baking can, would shake the dice and broadcast into the can. <laughs> and We had a baseball league complete with uniforms and fight songs, and we'd, we'd choose from the American League, the National League, and the American Association on an equal basis, which probably wasn't quite true, but the American Association was our true love in those days with sure. the Millers and Saints. Sure. And then we'd have our games and keep our stats. And Don and I both feel that was a huge impetus toward our future career right there. That's how the legends start out, folks. Uh, first of all, uh, then you went on to KUOM. You started uh, as you went to the University of Minnesota in That's 1946. Right. You kind of started off doing a lot of musical programs, which you have great knowledge of. At that point, were you hoping to get into sports? Oh, yes. Yeah, very definitely. It was still very much in my mind. KUOM was a, a local sunset station. But I enjoyed classical music and really had a chance to do a lot of it. KUOM then was strictly a, a classical music station. But they did go for football in the fall. And in 1951, they needed somebody to do it. Uh, they couldn't pay that person, but that was my fee at the time, so that was all right. Sure. And our program director, Bun Dawson, convinced them that I had a world of experience, which I didn't. <laughs> and uh, The so Long Long Island, was it? The, 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 the Long Island the Cavaliers. Long Island that Cavaliers. was my baseball was team way back in the shaking of the dice days. Sure, and, sure. and so uh, Bun uh, talked to them, and we came to Monday of the first game, and I thought, well, I really should find out who's going to be doing the games, because I heard and heard, and I called... Ike Armstrong, the athletic director, I called his secretary, Thelma, 
And she said, oh, I've been meaning to call you. She said, uh, uh, you can't charge over 250 a meal when you're on the road. <laughs> well, that was how I found out that I was doing the Gopher Games effective that Saturday. I had worked on uh, turning off the sound on Sunday exhibition games of the pro football games and doing the play-by-play -play in Mr. Paul Lou's office, our manager. On Sunday, we weren't on the air, so that was great. <laughs> and so that was my preparation. Of course, it started a long string of games. Now you're well over 400 game, gopher games in your career. Let's talk about some of the gopher memories. Obviously, there's so many of them that you couldn't possibly list them all. But what are some of the, the games, perhaps the players, that, that you'll remember the most about gopher football? It's hard to nail down players because there are so many who were special, but uh, Paul Geel would be one of them, uh, partly because he's a good friend and was my co-broadcaster for several years at CCO, but more than that, he was one of the truly outstanding football players, and he started the same time I did. 1951 mm -hmm. was his first year as a player and my first year as a broadcaster. And Paul, as he said, uh, I may not be big, but I'm slow. And to some <laughs> degree, that was true. But uh, he made the most of what he had and then some and really was an outstanding player. He was robbed of that Heisman Trophy, too, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, <laughs> he came so close to Johnny Lattner. And uh, to my knowledge, uh, no second place finisher has ever been closer to first place, which doesn't change anything. Sure. Lattner still was the, the trophy winner. But uh, I've always been disappointed that Paul didn't make it because he had all the qualities that a Heisman winner should have. And uh, in later years, uh, defensively, uh, Oh, Tom Brown was just an outstanding player. He, he made his fame as a pro player in Canada, but he was really something. And now we're going back to days when they played both ways, sure. too. And Brown was on the line both offensively and defensively. And Paul, his key game against Michigan, he intercepted two passes as well as having an outstanding day at throwing the ball and running it. So you had those in the early years, and then you have uh, Carl Eller, it, it's hard just to nail people down because right. there are so many that were outstanding. How about some of the, the bigger games with a the couple upsets against Michigan? Those yeah, the one, the Michigan in 1977, the 16 to nothing game, that was at Minneapolis and ended a long string by Michigan and a twice as long string in which they had never been shut out. And then uh, in 1986 when the Gophers won, when Foggy had a, that great run that set it up and then we got the field goal from Low Miller and that won it at Michigan. And that's especially sweet when you can fill that people the, that stadium with over 100,000 people and shut them up. Right. <laughs> they, just, they were silent when they went and left that stadium after it was over. Of course, uh, Michigan and Ohio State dominated in, in those middle 70s years. Uh, as they still do to and some still extent. Do. That's right, yeah. Um, but, so it's always special to beat Michigan. Um, perhaps the most unusual gopher game and the one least expected to win, and uh, the one we did win, was in 19. 1973, when uh, our starting quarterback was John Lawing, and he was backed up by a freshman named Tony Dungy. Well, Lawing was out with an injury. Tony's elbow swelled up in the middle of the week, and, and he still doesn't know, nor does anybody else, what caused it. Huh. But anyhow, he couldn't play. And so a backup quarterback, a senior named Gil Fash, who had been with the team for three and a half years and had never been in a game all week long, he was the, quote, opposing quarterback. And, and he did it very well. And now here all of a sudden he's in a game and he completed, I think it was two out of 12 passes with four interceptions, but he never fumbled and we did not have one penalty. And Illinois fumbled the ball away six times and we won the ball game, 19 game. to 16. Yeah, a lot of great memories. We're going to come back and talk more about Gopher sports, maybe talk a little more into the Gopher basketball. We're with Ray Christensen here on Speaking of Sports. We'll take a time out. We'll come right back. Olivier Saint-Jean uh, from Versailles, France, replaces Maktar Njai from Dakar, Senegal. We'll continue our report from the United Nations later. At the line, Colander.
Well, welcome back to the program. Speaking of sports, uh, we're talking with Ray Christensen of WCCO Radio. Of course, we've been reliving some of the Gopher uh, memories. Uh, we talked earlier, Michigan, Ohio State, as we mentioned, dominated in those 70s and 80s. The Gophers haven't had their Big Ten title since 67 and the Rose Bowl even before that. Can the Gophers regain the tradition that they had back in the 60s? It's, it's been a while. It's hard to give a positive answer, but I certainly feel more positive with Jim Wacker at the helm. He is a fine recruiter, and he's an optimist about life, not just football. And I think he's a very good coach with a good staff. So we uh, don't have the advantages of those that have, like Michigan and mm -hmm. Ohio State. And our location is not always ideal for recruiting. But nonetheless, you've got to feel that eventually the pendulum will swing back our way and hopefully eventually isn't too Someday, far away. Right. How about the move from, uh, um, from off campus to the Metrodome? What were your thoughts on that and perhaps did that play into the recruiting role? I'm sure it helped on recruiting because uh, recruits from other parts of the country are very impressed when they get into the Metrodome. There's no question about that. Personally, and this disappoints a lot of people when I say this, uh, I love the Metrodome uh, for very selfish reasons. It's a perfect place to broadcast from. Our location is absolutely ideal. It's always 70 degrees. There's no window to decide on whether it should be open or closed right. because it doesn't have to be. It's, it's not cold. just an open space there. And I really enjoy broadcasting from there. Whereas we were above row 62 at uh, Memorial Stadium, and it was cold. Sad the to see. press row was heated, but we sure. weren't in the press row. <laughs> was it sad to see the old brick house uh, come on down? Yeah, in some ways, but it was not a particularly good football stadium. Over half the seats were beyond the goal lines, and, you know, that's not very good. Yeah. How about uh, another topic in college football that we hear a lot of is the col college playoff system to decide that national champion. What, do you thought, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, well, there again are pros and cons. Any kind of playoff, especially in football, would take players uh, away from classes even more than what the season does now. And that's certainly a negative because they are still student athletes and most of them are not going to be going on to a professional career. A few of them, yes, but uh, do you cater to the few or do you cater to the many? And even the few that go on, their average career will be three to four years when you strike the average. There are some that are playing for 12 and 13, but sure. they're the great exception. Sure. And they've got to go on. Life continues after that. Right. Well, go for football, of course, has been a big part of your life over 40 years. But you've also had a chance to do other sports. And I believe it was in 1956 when you jumped over to WLOL. Uh, a lot of opportunities came away, including go for basketball, uh, as well as Laker basketball. And That's also right. some yeah. minor league baseball. So that was quite a year. Yes, it was. Yeah, I did the Lakers for the four years, the final four years. They were here before they became the Los Angeles Lakers. <laughs> and I did uh, first the Saints for a year and a half. I picked them up in midseason. And then we switched over to the Millers at WLOL and did those. And then, of course, when the Twins came along, I was out of a baseball job at least. But uh, we had other things going. And then in the, in the late 60s, I had the the Vikings, my last broadcast, was the game they lost to Kansas City in the Super Bowl, January 1st of 1970. Hmm. And then uh, that same coming season, I started with the Twins for four years. And you tell me now that there's a possibility we may hear you on Twins broadcast again. Yes, uh, this sounds like, well, he's taking over. I'm not at all. Herb <laughs> Carneal's contract, as I understand it, calls for him to have two weeks off during the season, which is great. And uh, WCCO asked if I would be interested in filling in for Herb while he was gone. Well, the bad part of that is I don't get to work with Herb because of the nature sure. of it, but I do get to work with John Gordon, a good friend and somebody that I can work easily with. So, and, and I get to do Twins baseball, so there's certainly right. more pluses than minuses. As a kid, baseball was kind of your number one sport. Is that the one oh, sport yes. you think you'd rather do? Oh, not necessarily. I'd, I'd rather do whatever sport I'm doing at the moment. So I, I can't say that. I, I do enjoy baseball. It's a very cerebral game. There are so many possibilities. Once you get a man on base, there are any number of possibilities of bringing him around. And then you, even with the bases empty, you have the suddenness of a home run. Sure. So it, it has a, a little of everything in that way. 
How about, of course, in your early days, some people may not realize that you didn't travel with the teams on the road. You had to, to recreate the game in the studio. On the Millers and the Saints, yeah. The only games on the road we did live were when I was part of the All-Star game and would do an inning or two along with all the other broadcasters of the American Association. So we did them on the road uh, using Western Union sitting at home in the studio. And we had a crowd background going, and we tried to alternate tapes there so the same beer seller wasn't yelling out every 19 <laughs> minutes or so. That's where your creativity really came into play. Yeah, I'm a ham. I, <laughs> I was a radio actor before I was anything else, I think, in radio at, at KUOM. And so uh, I always enjoyed doing recreations. It was great fun. And to, we had the sound of the bat, which I used a, a drummer's box, which is part of a symphony orchestra section and uh, just a little box like this with slots in it hollow inside I'd hit it with a pencil and it's better than people who sawed off bats and hang would hang those suspended over the microphone well it it just sounded like lumber not like a bat <laughs> of course your versatility in broadcasting I think was best summed up in, in one of the prefaces by uh, your cohort at CCO Roger Erickson who said you're as comfortable with Mozart and Bach as you are with Giel and Cap and you do a pretty good Freddie the Freight Elevator as well uh, the versatility in broadcasting, we really don't see that as much anymore, do no, we? No, everything has become so specialized. Like uh, people have said, if you could start over, would you like to do the same thing? I would, but if I could start over now, I wouldn't be able to do the same thing. Uh, I doubt if there would be any station doing the range that I, I would like to do. So I've been very fortunate in my career being able to do a lot of things. If I could do only sports, I'm sure I would tire of sports. Mm -hmm. And in semi-retirement, I'll do only sports, but that's not a big deal. It's not year-round. Sure. We're going to take another time out here on Speaking of Sports. We're going to come back, talk a little bit more on the gopher basketball scene over the years with Ray Christensen. Of course, you're watching Speaking of Sports, and we'll be right back. Whip to the head into the front court, left side, Orr with it. Back out. Grim back to Orr. From three-point range, it's good! First three of the game by Orr, and now it's 17 to 2. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. We're talking with Ray Christensen, and of course, uh, Ray is out with the book. Golden Memories, along with Stu Thornley, uh, available pretty much anywhere out uh, through Noden Press. And we're talking about some of the stories. Uh, let's go to Gopher Basketball. Of course, you started up uh, with Gopher Basketball in the 50s. Uh, what, uh, I guess most of the excitement didn't hit Gopher Basketball until around the early 70s when Bill Musselman came to town. Would that be fair to say? Well, uh, there were some great players yeah, back in the early you days. Had, uh, yeah, earlier than that, 62-63 uh, season, you had the Hudson Yates Clark combination, which uh, still may be my favorite team that favorite. one year. Lou Hudson probably would be my favorite player. He, he was special. Lou was uh, undercut, I remember, when we played Creighton University of Omaha and uh, broke uh, the bone in his right hand. He was a right-hander. And uh, they put a cast on it, and uh, after missing, I don't remember, three, four games, he was able to come back in and play and he became a left-hander as well. And I've often felt that made Lou Hudson as a pro, which was what to follow. It also helped outlaw that kind of cast because he was a little too efficient with it and got more rebounds with the threat of that cast. <laughs> Not that Lou was mean. He was at a certain degree of it because a good basketball player, especially a big man, has to be mean. That's, that's right. the way you play the game. But uh, I've often felt that that unfortunate break proved to be a lucky break, to use the term, for Lou Hudson. A lot of uh, incidents that have occurred through Gopher basketball, of course. The, the one that occurred in Ohio State probably sticks out in your mind, not for good reasons, because it was, uh, as you termed it, a brutal assault. Oh, yeah. That was 1972 when uh, the Gophers, uh, late in the game, a little over about a minute and a half to play, as I recall, uh, uh, they, uh, there have been a lot of chippy stuff in the game. Mm -hmm. Basketball has that. Sure. Lou Woody certainly was uh, guilty of that. But at the same time, uh, that didn't absolve the Gophers from what happened. It was a mugging on the floor, yeah. and I said at the time that this game should be called and awarded to Ohio State, which had the lead at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, within a few seconds after I said that, Paul Giel down below was out on the floor with that decision. And I got 
10 letters, that's a lot of letters uh, uh, saying that I sh should be, uh, oh, I don't know, certainly uh, knocked off the air would be the worst of it and uh, <laughs> reprimanded, if nothing else, would yeah. be the mildest of it. Most of them were from university students, but then I got a lot of response indicating, well, you called it just like it was and uh, mm -hmm. applauding me for it. And two of those students then wrote a second time and later and said they had been wrong and realized it. And, and that takes a lot to do, to sit down and write a second letter to sure. say you were wrong. And yeah. I've always appreciated that. Was that kind of the springboard in those years? Michael Thompson came out. Of course, as you mentioned, the great, uh, they had a good team back in the 70s with uh, Bahia yeah, That team went on to Taylor. win the Big Ten title right. yeah, with the Iron Five, as they were called. Uh, Charlie Sims, who uh, lives in St. Paul, and I think Charlie's a dentist, as I recall now. And uh, anyhow, he was the sixth man, but basically it was five Just plus five. occasionally Charlie. Sure. Dave Winfield, of course. Yeah, Winfield. Dave was on there. <laughs> Was and he perhaps the, the best all-around athlete to come out of the university, do you think? It might be. Uh, he had the greatest potential physically. He was uh, a very special athlete, no doubt about that. But uh, then you had uh, Paul Giel, who had a, a similar career in baseball and football, whereas uh, with Winfield, it was basketball and baseball. And baseball was right. number one with Dave. He sure. really had just played intramural ball. and. Jimmy Williams, the assistant coach, saw him and said, hey, why don't you come out for basketball? So he came out for basketball and mm -hmm. was just an outstanding player. If you had to pick the, the, the all-Ray Christensen basketball team, who would be your starting five? Oh, boy, that's tough. Michael Thompson, Lou Hudson, maybe Jim Brewer just to get his rebounding. He was not that good a shot, but he really could rebound. And the guards would be tough, but... Uh, I guess I'd like to have Ray Williams on it. He was only with us for two years, but oh, how he could run the fast break. And after that, I don't know. Maybe I'd need a tempering influence like a Flip Saunders. Uh, if you asked me this a, a day later, I might have a different team at guard. Sure. I don't know, but for now, that'll do. <laughs> I'll settle for those. That would be a pretty good team yeah, in my right. book, I would think. Mm -hmm. Was uh, the 89-90 season when they went to the Elite, the Elite Eight, was that perhaps uh, the most enjoyable season? It, it could be. Uh, certainly that string of four games where we almost went to the Final Four, where we played Texas El Paso in really a bad game. They were worse than we were, fortunately, so we won that one. But then we played Northern Iowa, which was a very good team and played very well, and we beat them. And then we knocked off Syracuse, which was one of the top teams nationally. In the second half, we shot almost 80%, and Newbern and Lynch at guard simply said, you are not going to beat us. We won't permit it. And they didn't, and we won by 7, 82 to 75, I think. And then we went on, and that crazy game with Georgia Tech and had a chance to win it on the final shot by right. Kevin Lynch. Now, it wasn't close, and I'm glad it wasn't an in-and-outer in many ways, <laughs> but I saw that go off the rim. That was the end of the game, and I didn't feel downhearted. I just felt, hey, these kids have come so far, and I've been able to be a part of it. And it was a wonderful feeling. Right. I suppose Denver and the Final Four would have been more wonderful, but uh, I'll settle for what we It was we a had. good run. Well, one guy, of course, we haven't mentioned is Kevin McHale, who just was honored out in Boston recently. Sure. If you ask me tomorrow, Kevin's on my team. Sure, because of his rebounding. Hall of Fame, uh, NBA Hall of Fame. Oh, event. yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. he just received that honor, and that's great. Kevin... Uh, kind of a young colt when he played with the Gophers. He was all elbows and knees. And to some degree, in his late stages at Boston, he still was elbows and knees, but a lot of more meat on him, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and always fun to be around. Right. Well, of course, uh, in, in the book itself, uh, you put a chapter on family. And of course, that's been very important um, in your life, your wife, Ramona, and you've got three children who actually two of your sons were able to work with you. That's right. Tom did first. And for the last 15 years, Jim has worked with me. And that's been very special. Uh, it's partly because of the family, it's because it's how they got started. But right. beyond that, uh, for example, with Jim, there was no one I would rather have because he understands me, not just because I'm his father, but because he knows me as a broadcaster. Mm -hmm. And he'll feed me a little information. He'll see things happening on the bench, like somebody with an ice pack on the knee that I don't have time to look for. I'm following the ball. Right. And things like that that'll be so helpful, plus the fact that he knows the sport. My daughter, Sue, uh, knows sports in and out. She understands she's the big what's twins behind thing. it. Oh, yeah, yeah. she yeah. loves the twins. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, she's number one on the twins list, uh, even ahead of Jim. Right. Of course, you made your home here in the northern suburbs, and you've been here for quite a while, and you've really been a part of the community. Oh, yeah. I've been in New Brighton since uh, 1959. 
Well, that's when we uh, first moved into a, a new development, which is an older development now, but we've mm -hmm. lived there all those years just off Forestdale Road and uh, Highway 694. One of the stories that uh, we've got to bring up, talking about priorities and family, and was a story when I believe it was the 8990 run when uh, CBS was calling and Brent Musburger wanted to do an interview. Yeah, that was uh, early in that run when we were in Richmond and uh, were waiting for the second game, and uh, CBS called me, uh, producer, not Brent Musburger. Right. He was not directly involved at all. Uh, I, I like Brent, and we got along beautifully, <laughs> but uh, on Saturday, uh, before the Sunday game, CBS called me in my hotel room and said, we'd like to have you record an interview with Brent Musburger before the game tomorrow to be used during the game. And I said, that would be great. And they said, it'll be at 12 noon at the arena. And I said, well, I'm going to Mass at 11 o'clock, and I would guess that I could get there by shortly after 12, but I, I couldn't promise 12 o'clock, no later than 12.15. And right. they said, no, it's 12 or not at all. I said, in that case, it's not at all. And I thanked him for considering me and hung yep. up. And the and next day, I, I, I felt the story was worth explaining, so I tried to be diplomatic. And uh, I explained what had happened and then concluded that, contrary to uh, some opinions, uh, the network television, uh, network television as such, is not God. And, uh, <laughs> and let it go at that. And there it is. I had a nice response to that from one minister in South Dakota who was driving and heard that. <laughs> right. And he stopped and got off the road and jotted down a couple of notes so that he could write me a letter, which he did. He did. Well, Ray, it's been a very quick half hour. We want to thank you for your time. And once again, the name of the book is Golden Memories out uh, on Node Press along with Stu Thornley, uh, a great keepsake. And I uh, definitely would recommend it. Ray, thanks again.